All right, the last section of our skeletal system is on the types of joint movement. And the first type of movement that we have is gliding. Gliding takes place when two bone surfaces slide past each other. For instance, with the carpal and tarsal bones um, slide past each other, as well as between the clavicle and the sternum. So with this type of movement, the amount of movement is very slight, but it can really happen in any direction. Now, gliding is something that's hard to see, but we're actually going to spend a lot of our time here talking about angular motion. Angular motion actually includes six different types of movement. That includes flexion, which is when the angle between the bones is reduced, like when you flex your arm at your elbow. Okay, the the angle between your radius and ulna and your humerus actually goes down. Now what we're going to see is for a lot of these movements, if we move one way, we actually also have the opposite. And that actually kind of makes sense because we need to be able to undo any actions that we perform, otherwise we can only do it once and then we can't ever do it again, which really doesn't make a lot of sense. So the opposite of flexion is extension, and this is when the angle between the two bones that articulate with each other is actually increased. Like when you um, take your arm from the flexed position, 90 degrees, out to 180, so it's flat. Now hyperextension occurs when the extension extends beyond normal anatomical position, and this is really easy to see with the wrist. Okay, You can flex your wrist by taking your palm and pushing it down towards your arm and then if you bring it back to anatomical position that is extension but you can also bend your wrist backwards towards um, you know so that the palm is facing up towards the sky and that is actually hyperextension now sometimes hyperextension is a normal thing like with the wrist um, but sometimes it can be a bad thing like if you hyperextend a joint um, it actually can create some problems with the ligaments and tendons around the joint the fourth type is something called abduction, ABD, duction, which is movement away from the longitudinal axis. And the way I remember this one is when you abduct something, um, you're taking it away. Like if a child, and I know this is a, a bad example, but um, it's not a nice example, but when a child gets abducted, they get taken away from their parents. So um, if you abduct a uh, a, a joint, you're moving it away from its longitudinal axis. The opposite of abduction is adduction, so you're adding it back, um, so you're moving it towards the longitudinal axis. Now the longitudinal axis can run either down the center of the body like we've been discussing, or it can actually run down the center, like all the way down the center of your arms or the center of your legs. So um, like my fingers can actually abduct and adduct adduct by opening and closing, spreading and then compressing my fingers. I'm doing that motion. Now the last one gets actually confused with the, the next one that we'll talk about, but the last one in this one is uh, circumduction, where you can move things in a loop. For instance, I can take my shoulder and actually make a loop and I can continue around and around and around for as many different times as I want. Now circumduction often gets confused with rotation. Now rotation is when we turn around the longitudinal axis um, and again this can be longitudinal axis of the body like our neck rotates back and forth. Um, this is different than circumduction because with rotation I have a limit. Uh, in other words, I can't keep continuing around um, unless I'm like Linda Blair from The Exorcist. My head cannot go around and around and around um, like an owl's. And so that's not, ro or that's not circumduction, that's rotation where I reach a stop point and I actually have to rotate it back and reach another stop point. Now rotation can also cause pronation and supination of the wrist and hand. Pronation is when we take the palm that in anatomical position is facing anterior or ventral and it flips to facing dorsal. So when I take it from palm up and twist it to palm down, that is pronation. Supination is the opposite where I take it from facing palm down and turn it so that the palm is facing towards the front of my body. 
Now, based on these movements, we can actually classify our synovial joints. So this is based on the shape of the articulating surface, so it's going to determine the movement, and we have six different types of joints. The first one is called a gliding joint, and gliding joints are f have flat surfaces that slide across each other. So these provide gliding movement that is very small, but in any direction. Examples of locations that uh, carry out gli or are gliding joints are where the clavicle meets with the sternum, between the carpal bones, between the tarsal bones, and between our vertebrae. Right? So you can see here with the diagram that the clavicle can move and the manubrium is simply the upper part of the sternum and it can move in any direction. Hinge joints are the next classification and basically you're changing the angle of this joint in a single plane. It's very much like a door opening and closing. I wouldn't expect to open a door and have a door slide upwards. I wouldn't uh, expect to close a door and have it slide downwards. Examples of hinge joints are the elbow, the knee, and the ankle. So it's a simple up and down motion. Now notice with the elbow, this is specifically the ulna and the humerus. We will have the ulna interacting with the radius, providing a different type of movement. Pivot joints are ones that permit rotation only. So if I have a, a joint that uh, ro rotates only, it is pivot. For example, between the atlas and axis, on my neck and between the radius and ulna in my elbow. Believe it or not, when you twist your wrist, you're actually twisting your radius and your ulna. Okay, so like I said, between the radius and the ulna and the atlas and the axis. An ellipsoidal joint, basically you've got an oval face of one bone that actually nests into a depression with a neighboring bone. So the motion occurs back, to, back and forth and side to side. And if you take your pointer finger, you can go back and forth, so front to back and side to side. All right, and that's um, actually the phalanges with your metacarpals. Um, your phalanges with your metatarsals do that as well, and your radius and your carpal bones do that as well, because your wrist can go back and forth and side to side. You can wave back and forth and side to side. All right. Now, this diagram actually shows this happening here, but I think this is actually a better um, place for it to show in terms of an ellipsoidal joint. All right, saddle joints. They literally fit together, the bones do, like a rider sitting on a saddle. And so the opposing bone faces actually nest together and kind of hook into each other. Now this type of joint permits circumduction, but not rotation. And the example of this is the joint at the base of the thumb. Now, this is what allows us to twiddle our thumbs, but if you try to rotate your thumb, you can't do it. You actually have to pick up your you know, hold your thumb with your other hand, your other fingers, and kind of gently twist it in order to rotate. Now the last classification of joints is the ball and socket joint, which is one you're probably familiar with. Basically we've got the round head of one bone nesting inside a cup um, depression in another bone, like the rotator cup or cuff, so to speak. All of the movement types, all of our angular movements, abduction, adduction, flexion, extension, circumduction, and rotation can take place with a ball and socket joint. And the two big examples are the shoulder and the hip. Now I want to take a couple minutes here, there's the shoulder, um, to go through some of the vertebral articulations that we have. Now the reason why is because the way the vertebrae interact is actually more complicated than our usual single joints because we don't just have two bones working together, we have three. One that's above each vertebra and one that's below. Now these vertebra are separated by pads that are called intervertebral discs. And these discs are made of a tough outer layer of fibrous cartilage and inside's like a soft, almost jelly-like core. So we've got kind of this tough outer skin and inside it's like soft and gooey. 
What these discs do is they prevent bone-to-bone -bone contact and they act as a shock absorber for our vertebral column. Now if I were to take all of the vertebral discs out of my spinal cord, um, we'd actually be a lot shorter. Our, those discs account for about 25% of the length within our spinal column. Now, as we get older, we have some changes that occur with these intervertebral discs. The first part is that the gelatin starts to degenerate after we physically mature, and you guys are actually pretty close to your physical maturation point. That um, usually happens in your early 20s. So once that happens, you actually start to degenerate the gelatin, and it makes the cushioning less effective. In addition, the outer fibrous cartilage loses its elasticity, so its ability to kind of spring back, it, it gets kind of stiff and brittle. And if that happens enough, the gelatin part can actually break through the cartilage and lead to something called a herniated disc or a slipped disc. Basically means the same thing. Um, the gelatin actually kind of oozes out of the fibrous cartilage. And what that does is it actually kind of tilts the um, vertebral column in such a way that um, it causes some problems because it can press on the spinal nerves, nerves or actually pinch them and this condition is actually very very painful. Now you may have heard that as we get older we actually start shrinking and that's true but not for the reason you probably think because as we get older the water content decreases with our age and that's what makes us shorter. It's not that our bones are getting shorter or anything, it's simply the water content that's going down. Now I want to take two minutes here and go through our knee just because the knee is such a complicated joint. Um, it's complicated despite the fact that it's just simply a hinge joint. Because I don't have anything that actually nests in like a hinge like we do with the elbow, um, it makes it a lot more complicated. The knee has two menisci, plural of meniscus, and these remember are cartilage pads that cushion the, both the femur and the tibia. And these function to change the shape, their shape as the femur moves. So as the femur rocks on the top of the tibia, they actually change their shape so that the um, cushioning effect is still taking place. There are ligaments that stabilize the other surfaces. And the ones that we know about the most are the anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments that you guys know better as the ACL and the PCL. And these function to attach the tibia to the femur actually within the joint capsule. And you can see those here on this diagram. This is the ACL, and notice that it's on the inside. Basically the patella um, is, is kind of, if the knee is bent, it's kind of back up in here. Uh, but you really can't feel these ligaments when they tear. Um, typically what happens is you kind of plant and try to rotate and you, that's when you tear this and you just completely go down. There's no contact, there's no nothing. Um, and you can see that these are actually buried right in the middle of the knee here. Alright, so they're very, very um, well buried within the knee surface. You also have some other um, ligaments. You have your um, lateral ligament and you have your medial ligament here and these are the meniscus. It's actually two of them, medial and lateral. That's it for the skeletal system and I hope you review your notes and if you have any questions please let me know.